Clean Code was written back in 2008, just two years after AWS was released to the public. With cloud computing still in its infancy, and mobile development referring to building applications for dumb phones, it's pretty clear that Clean Code was written for a different era of programming. Four more books under the Clean brand have been published since the original came out. And in many ways, this term has now become associated with Uncle Bob Martin. He is the author of these clean books. And he is also one of the original signers of the Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Also has a pretty interesting Twitter timeline, um, but we won't get into that. What's more important is talking about how this term has really become an overloaded one. Oftentimes you will see people on pull requests asking to clean the code up, or could you write this in a cleaner way? And I feel like it's really lost a lot of its meaning. So before I teach you about how to write clean code for the modern era, can we get rid of that overloaded term and just say what we actually mean, which is to say, hey, could you write this code better? Or could you just write good code? And with that out of the way, I guess like, how do you go about writing good code? When I go about writing good code, I like to follow five different principles, and those are pretty simple to keep in mind. Good code is independent code. Good code is readable code. Good code is predictable code. Good code is observable code. And most of all, good code is the right code. So let's talk about each one of those a little bit more in depth. Independent code tends to be written in small chunks. These small chunks you can think of as functions that are no more than 20 lines long or classes that are no more than 100 lines long. Of course, these are general approximations and it doesn't mean that if you write a function that's 21 lines long that you're automatically doing something wrong. Or if you write a class that's 200 lines long, that it's incorrect. These are just good things to have gut checks for. Since independent code is smaller, it also means it's going to be easier for you to reuse. Yes, there are times where you're going to have to write hyper-specific code that isn't going to be reusable. But again, the beauty of it is you're writing small independent chunks. And so even those bits that aren't reusable are small independent chunks. Oftentimes I find myself building larger components out of many different smaller components. And then those larger components tend to be the ones that are solving for those very specific problems because they're building off of the different building blocks that are very general, and then injecting some very hyper-specific code to make it do the specific thing that it needs to do. Even though the components themselves are getting larger, the amount of code you're writing is still about the same amount because it's just, again, building off of those building blocks. Independent code isn't very useful if you don't know what's going on though. This is why readable code is equally as important. Readable code should resemble a well-written essay. This means that at the top of the file, you should have the big picture ideas. And as you get further and further down into the file, you get into the more nitty gritty details. I'm using file as a general term here. If you're using an object oriented programming language, then you can replace file with class. And if you're using a more functional language, then I guess you just keep file as file and it's just a collection of functions for you. I use Kotlin, so I guess I get the best of both worlds or the worst of both worlds, but anyway. Readable code also relies on simpler naming conventions. If you have an integer that represents money, instead of calling it X or money int, you might just call it money or amount. This doesn't mean that you can't include the type in the name. Sometimes that will make sense. For example, if you have a list of addresses, you might call that address list, or you might go with something like addresses. Really, either one can be okay. And just want to say there's plenty of nuance when it comes to naming things. It's probably one of the hardest parts of our job. Readable code doesn't matter that much though, if the code itself isn't reliable. And this is why predictable code is also very important. Predictable code is well-defined code. While I'm sure that one day ChatGPT will open up its own pull requests or even inject its own logic into existing binaries, we're not quite there yet. And until that day comes, the code that is running on machines was written by a person. And any unexpected behavior is not the program running amok. It, it can only be attributable to human error. The 9000 series has a perfect operational record. Predictable code relies on a finite number of states. And while this will vary from language to language, this usually means you're going to be dealing with things like enums or sealed classes to define all of the different permutations that can occur. Having a finite number of behaviors means that you now don't have to deal with an infinite number of behaviors. 
finite, it is a bit better than infinite. When I think of unpredictable code, I think of integers and strings being used to represent state. While it's true that integers have a finite number of states, that finite number of states is in the billions, and the situation just gets worse if you're using strings to represent state. That is something that I would argue has an infinite number of states, and if you wanna argue with me in the comments down below, feel free to do so. Just be sure to smash the like button on your way down there. Predictable code also tends to follow well-known, generally accepted design patterns. Since these patterns and data structures are well-established, they're pretty easy to understand and pick up, even if you're not familiar with the code base. And then if you're not familiar with those data structures or design patterns, you can Google them and you can get 20, 50, a million different articles outlining how they work. There's probably some YouTube videos out there talking about it too. So it's really easy to pick up and understand as opposed to trying to learn a very custom design pattern that is only specific to the company that you work for and is also probably not documented. Predictable code also follows a style guide. This style guide might be based off of the language itself, or it could be a third party one. The important thing that matters is you have a style guide and you stick to it. If you disagree with the style guide, but you're working on a larger team, work on making those changes as a group. Don't go rogue and inject your own coding style because that just makes the project more difficult to understand. And with these style guides, really what we're going after is something that is easy to scan through, predictable, just easy to read. Even the most predictable code is still hard to know if it's behaving as expected in production though. This is why observability is super important for good code. Observable code is easy to neglect, but it has an immense amount of value to the projects that you work on. Observable code makes use of logging in such a way that when something unexpected happens, you know about it. Not only do you know about it, but you also know what you have to do to fix it, or at least have a pretty good hunch on what needs to happen or what needs to change. Observable code never fails silently unless that's just a requirement such as an analytics event firing where you don't wanna crash the app because that didn't happen, or if an error occurs and you have a reasonable way to recover from it. I prefer throwing exceptions and crashing the applications that I work on when we encounter something that isn't expected and we can't recover from. This makes it very apparent that there is something wrong and it needs to be fixed. And ideally that is caught before it ever goes out to the general public. But when it doesn't and you get those large number of crash reports, it's a pretty uncomfortable feeling, but what is more uncomfortable for me is knowing that there is a number of users out there working with an application that I wrote and it's not working as expected and I don't know about it and my users probably don't have a great way of letting me know about it. So while not crashing is good for you as the developer, it's not good for your users. So just crash the app when you can't do anything better. Observable code usually comes with automated tests as well. Testing strategies are going to vary from project to project and company to company. In general though, you are going to want a large number of unit tests that run blazingly fast, a smaller number of integration tests that are going to validate that the different units of code work together, and then some small amount of end-to-end -end tests that validate the most important parts of your application work as expected. If these tests fail, that acts as an alert to you that something is wrong and you need to go and fix it. But failing tests really only matter if you are writing useful code for your users. The right code is code that solves problems for your users, and the right code is going to vary based on project, team, and company. If you work for an unprofitable startup, then the right code is often the code that helps to increase the metrics that your startup cares the most about. This means you're going to write some ugly code. It's not going to be good code. It is going to be bad code. But the best thing that you can do for yourself and future engineers working on the code is to make it very clear that this code is not meant to be reused. It's not meant to be added onto. If you need to work with this ever again, throw it away and rewrite it. You wanna structure your code in the most unfriendly way that it puts people in a position where they go, yeah, I should just rewrite this instead of just adding on to the big ball of mud. On the other hand, if you work for a larger company, say a Fortune 100 company, chances are good that you are going to wanna to spend a lot more time making this code perfect because even if 1% of your users hit an issue, 
1% of a million is a lot of pissed off people and 1% of a billion is a pretty small country and I don't really want a small country mad at me. So in these situations, because your brand is so important, you are going to spend extra time to make things work exactly as they should. And you're going to catch all of the different edge cases that you need to catch to avoid having a brand oopsie daisy. The right code can also come in the form of performance as well. Sometimes your code needs to perform really well and the other things like making it readable or making it small and independent become less important. For example, if you're working on a game, chances are good that you're going to want it to either perform really well out of the gate or write some pretty bad code that gets the job done and then you can go back and write it again in a more performant way. But that's where things get tricky because write code means it's good code. And sometimes the right code is going to be bad code. And while this may not be great to hear that there is no single recipe to write good code, what I can say is this channel focuses on making you a good and better software engineer. So be sure to hit the subscribe button if you want to watch more videos and learn about how to become a better software engineer. And if after watching this video, you're feeling like a bit of an imposter and you're worried that your coworkers are going to find out, don't worry, they already know. Check out this video next if you wanna learn about the seven things that I've seen software engineers screw up the most and how to avoid making those mistakes or correct those mistakes. That's it, that's the video.